All right, everybody. Hello. My name is Alan Wang. Most of you know me. I'm Keller Williams, San Clover Valley Operating Principal. Of course, I manage the Alan Wang Realty Group as well. Really excited to host this class on what I call getting to the heart of people. And what, what do I mean by that? It sounds, it sounds high level, a little bit vague, but uh, this real estate business is all about people. And I think we as a realtor group, some of us, not all of us, have forgotten about the fundamentals of this business, which is really about the people that you're servicing. This is why all these companies, these tech companies that are trying to, to get rid of agents, treating us as if we were just buying a, a plane ticket, if it were that simple, that to automate us, to be able to submit an offer online, all these tech related tools that companies are trying to build to basically get rid of us. There's a reason why it doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work is because real estate is complex. And it's complex not only from the transaction side, but it's complex because of people. I don't know about you, but I don't think people are simple at all. I mean, we have many dimensions. We, we have emotions. We have different emotions on different days. We have a rational side. We have emotional sides. We have the people around us that influence those emotions as well. Uh, we have dominant uh, folks in the relationship. We have outside I call them phantom buyers or phantom sellers that, that, that get into the decision-making process. Very, very complex. And that is why I don't feel that we realtors will be going anywhere because we as realtors know how to navigate that gray area with our clients to help guide them to the right decision. And most importantly, we know how to build long lasting relationships with them so that they keep calling us when they have real estate needs. And that's really what it boils down to. But it doesn't matter if you're a realtor or if you're in sales, or if you work in tech, or even if you're just you're, you're at, at a restaurant, you're a waiter or waitress, or you're a, a restaurant owner, or you manage a bank, it doesn't really matter. It really is all about relationships. And the folks that understand that will get further in their business. Right? Most of you know who I am already, but just to recap again, Alan Wang Realty Group here has just launched a new real estate office, Kelly in Santa Clara Valley in Santa Clara. We are looking for amazing agents, whether you're starting off in the middle of your career or you're in the later parts of your, your you're trying to build a team, uh, give us a call uh, or send us a direct message on whatever medium uh, works for you. We'd be happy to discuss and talk about how we can help you take your business to the next level. I want to put out a disclaimer. For those of you that do not like movies or, or don't like watching sitcoms or television, you, sh you can leave right now. No, I'm kidding. Um, not, not exactly, uh, but I am a huge movie buff and I love watching different shows of various types. There's just so much I love about them. So you will be getting a lot of that today. It's going to be a lot of fun. Today's going to be a really, really fun class and you will learn a lot. Now I want everyone, Olivia, I need you to audit this because I can't see everybody at the moment, but I want everyone, if you're right-handed to raise your right hand and if you're left-handed to raise your left hand, but I need you guys to swear an oath to me. And, and you can say this out loud or not, but basically I want you to just repeat after me. I agree that I will use the knowledge I learned today for good and not for evil. Perfect. Excellent. I don't want anybody going out taking what I learned and suddenly starting some strange Ponzi scheme or getting people into college by being on the road team. I don't want any of that. All right. I mean, this is all... Uh, high integrity uh, class. So I'm going to be teaching you guys a lot of secrets about how to work with people. I don't want you to use that for anything but good. And this movie here you see is Wreck-It Ralph. Uh, Ralph is actually, he's a character in a video game and he's actually a bad guy. But he doesn't want to be a bad guy. So this is the, all the bad guys in video games that actually want to be good guys. And so they're a bad guys anonymous class. I thought that was kind of a fun picture that I had to put up there. This is a, a movie that I really, really love, and I'm not going to ask you guys to guess since this is more of a web class, but uh, this book was written by nobody other than Mr. Jerry Maguire. For those of you that have not seen Jerry Maguire, he, he was a very successful sports agent, very successful, one of the best companies he had. I think he was at 70 plus clients that he was representing. He was doing extremely well. He was at the top of the food chain, but he woke up one day and he found that he hated himself. Well, why would you hate yourself? Sounds like you're making a lot of money. You got a lot of clients. You're the best company in the world. He was just kind of feeling like a sleazy salesman. This is what it was. His clients weren't really, they lost their love for the game. And he was just, 
dealing and willing and doing what he does, but it just, he didn't feel like there was anything personal about it. And so he spent all night writing this book, which, which he got binded at Kinko's and said, the key to this business is personal relationships. And that's what he discovered uh, was the secret, which is what his early mentor had taught him. So he wrote this memo and long story. I mean, there's a whole kind of downward downfall of his career for a moment, but it comes back at the end, like every Hollywood movie. But I really, really believe in this, this fact that the key to real estate as well, and the key to really business is personal relationships. And it's even more important in our business that we remember that. I do want us to take a step back and really think about in this journey of life. Right? I mean, we're all on this journey of life, trying to achieve different things in different parts of our lives. How do you want to be treated? I'll give you an example. I used to love going into my local bank because there was this one guy, his name was Buntu, and he sat in the back. And every time I came in, he greeted me with a big smile. And he was always extremely, just extremely gracious. Even though I had checks to deposit and there was a Wells Fargo right next to me, I wouldn't go to that Wells Fargo. I would go to the one where he was at, right? That Because I wanted to see him. I wanted to talk to him. And he understood that. No one else in that bank ever talked to me. But he always knew me by name, would greet me, talk to me, see how my family was doing. And I loved seeing him. I don't know that he didn't make any money off me or anything, I mean, but it was just great. And I think because of that, he did so well, they promoted him. And he's no longer in that branch. And now every time I walk in there, I just feel like a stranger again. Right? But take... Take note, right? Let's say you're, you're a, it's not the greatest example this time, but let's say you own a restaurant. I mean, how many times have you walked into that restaurant? And I mean, I'm a regular at so many restaurants or, or tea places and nobody knows my name. I mean, I spend a ton of money there. You don't ever feel that personal connection. And that's where I think it's lacking. Imagine if you were a business owner, and you did own a restaurant and you didn't know almost everybody's name that came through, especially your regulars. How much more tip would you get? How much more business would you get? How many more friends would they bring in? How many more people would they tell about your business? It's such a minor tweak, right? To just the way we operate. But people, so few people do it, right? They just keep turning, turning you know, seats, right? They're trying to get people in, trying to get people out, right? They're looking at, at, at turnover rates, right? How fast am I turning over my tables? That's what they're looking at. And I think sometimes we're the same way in this business. Right? We keep looking at our metrics, but forget about the people. But I want to step back. How would you want to be treated, right? Take a step back, right? If you're buying a house, how do you want to be treated? Do you want to be treated like, oh, hey, I got five minutes free right now, but sorry, I got to run to another meeting? Or do you want to feel that your realtor has your undivided attention anytime you, that they need you, that you're there, and that you're there available for them, and that you actually care, right? That they're just not another number. All right, that's how you would want to be treated on this journey. I would say take a page out of that, write down how you would like to be treated, put down that procedure, and mirror that for your customers. There's something I want to cover, which is called forming, storming, norming. Uh, for those of you that may not be aware of this, this, this is a model that was built by Bruce Tuckman in 1965. It's something that I've noticed in my days in program management or project management or team building in general is always the stages that people go through when they meet somebody. And I've, I found this to be universally true. When you meet somebody, the first thing you do, you kind of get to know them. You're forming. You guys probably know this, right? As realtors, you sit with your customer at, that, at the office, that first meeting or the coffee shop. There's always that kind of, I'm getting to know you, you're getting to know me, right? There, there's, there, it, it's, that's just the way it is. And you feel it, you know it. it it's normal. I just want to let you know it's normal, right? The first stage of meeting somebody is forming that relationship, trying to feel them out, right? See what they are. A second part of relationship or any team environment, I'm talking about you and your clients or you and your real estate team or any team, you and your church group, when you follow, form a little subcommittee, there's going to be the same dynamics, okay? Storming is the next thing. You're going to butt heads. Everybody's different, right? We all come from different backgrounds, different cultures, social, social backgrounds, uh, you know, different races. We have different ways that some are authoritative, some are more more vocal, individualistic. I mean, we have all these different, different, we come from different walks of life, right? We're from different, different parts of the States. I mean, one, you might be more conservative. I might be more liberal. I mean, you're going to storm as you get to know people. That's very, very normal. So if you detect that with you and your clients, normal, really normal. Eventually you get to a steady state, what Tuckman calls norming. And that's when you're, you know, you're, you're getting, you got to know each other, right? You know, you, 
you understand what they're looking for, they know how you work, and you start normalizing, and then you can really focus on achieving what you need to achieve, selling the house for top dollar, or helping them purchase their house, helping them think through their buying decisions, or just consulting, et cetera. You start norming, and then as a team, you really start hitting your stride, right? You feel that sometimes in relationships, team relationships, et cetera. You really start hitting your stride, you start performing, and all that's behind you. Uh, one thing that's really fascinating and I want to put out to you is studies have been done that if you throw another person into the team, this whole process starts over again. So have you noticed that when you go and you only meet the husband, for example, at the coffee shop, and you, you, you know, you've been talking to him for two or three weeks and you guys are about to go see a house and then the wife shows up to see the first house and she wasn't involved in all of these conversations, that suddenly she goes, this is exact, completely not what I want. You probably have been through this before. It's very important for you to include all the stakeholders in that initial meeting so you guys can form, storm, and norm together. And if you detect in that first meeting that there's an uncle or auntie or mom and dad or grandma, grandpa, or different folks that need to be involved, you need to get them all involved and get them out as soon as possible to see the same house together. I've been in, in families where the parents are very important. Their opinions are extremely important, whether they're giving them money or not. So what I've done is I've actually had the, the husband and wife and two sets of parents. So there's literally six of us looking at a house all together at the same time. Now you can imagine this is a scheduling nightmare, but why do you do this? Because I want everybody to learn together. I want everybody to talk together because we're going to make the decision together anyways. If one parent's not there, uh, then they're going to throw a wrench into the, all the plans. Everyone, all five people may like it, but if one parent didn't make it, then suddenly everything goes to heck. That's usually what happens. So it's really, really important to bring all the stakeholders in that first meeting. You need to identify who are the primary stakeholders. And you also need to extrapolate. Some people go, oh yeah, no, I am, I'm the decision maker for sure. And then you dig deeper and go, wait, your dad, it sounds like your dad's going to be chipping in a lot of down payment. Are you sure that he's not a stakeholder? Or is your mom a stakeholder? And you really have to dive in. Because no, my, my dad can please trust me and he lives out of country, so he won't be able to anyways. So, well, do you mind if I CC him on, on everything anyway? So that at least he feels like he's a part of the process, right? It, you just don't want that to happen when you spend six months looking for houses and finally right at the end, they're about to make an offer and then dad from abroad goes, this is an awful house. And, and by the way, dad is chipping the down payment. So dad does have a lot, a lot of input right? Or not, right? Sometimes it's just authoritative and they, they respect their parents' opinions. So you really have to figure that out. And that's one of the key lessons I would pass on to you when dealing with groups of people or teams of people. Okay. I want to hit the reset button. Quickly here. I mentioned this a little bit. I think we as realtors are very focused on we as realtors are really focused on uh, what's, you know, how many units did I sell? Uh, what's the volume? Uh, did I hit my goals, right? Sometimes I think we're, these are good. They're good drivers and they're good motivators. I really want to hit the reset button and I want to step back and, and go back to why did we do this, start this business in the first place? Now, I know we're all licensed sales, well, officially licensed salesperson, right? Based on the California Association of Realtor definition of us. I want to challenge us. I want to reset this. I mean, yes, that's what we are, but I don't like that word salesperson because it really implies that I'm just trying to sell you something. I really don't like that designation. I wish they would change the definition. Let's change our, our mindset and let's call ourselves a real estate agent. Okay. Agent for me is a very powerful word. What does the dictionary.com say? Let's define it. An agent is a person or business authorized to act on another's behalf. Number two definition, a person or thing that acts or has power to act. This is a very powerful statement. I want you to pause for a moment. A person or business authorized to act on another's behalf. A person or thing that acts or has the power to act. Essentially, you could operate as if you were your client. That's what an agent means. That is a very, very, very big responsibility. Now, this movie behind you, I don't know if you guys can recognize it, but this is Bernie Mac in the movie Transformers. That's Bumblebee there. Bumblebee was hiding and he suddenly showed up on the lot. He's never seen this car before, 
but he didn't care. He was going to sell it because it was on the lot. He was going to sell it. We don't want to be like Bernie Mac, right, in this movie where he's just trying to sell whatever he can that's on the lot. Right? That's not – that's a salesperson. And I think a lot of people have mapped real estate agents and going to map them, oh, you're no better than a car salesman, right? Just try to sell me a car and then I'll never hear from you again. That's actually not what we're supposed to be. Again, as Uncle Ben said in Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. And that's where it is in our hands. If we want to be agents to our clients and not just salespeople, that's a great responsibility. We need to put ourselves in their shoes as we're representing them. I personally don't think it's that difficult. If you can put that lens on, it should make your life a lot easier in decision making. Well, what would I do? Would I want to buy this house? If I had this $250,000 of, of structural damage, would I, I noticed this, this crack in the, the property inspection report, it makes me nervous. I would recommend getting a deeper dive. I mean, I think putting yourself in those shoes would, would make things a lot simpler in, in your, to do your job, a simpler method of doing your job. Another quote I liked hearing from the Shane company on the radio, we've learned that customers don't want to be sold to, but educated so that they can make their own decisions. I really, really, really like this quote. The reason is, especially in the Silicon Valley, where price points are 1.2 million median price, the homes are expensive. Secondly, your customers are extremely smart. I mean, they are the best of the best. They went to the top schools, undergrad, masters, MBA, PhD, you name it. They're very sharp people. Pressuring them to buy a $1.2 million house is not going to happen. They actually do not want that. And as soon as they smell it, they will run from you so fast, you just lost the client. You can't sell to them. It's not going to work. But you can shift your methodology by educating them. Become an expert. Become an advisor. Give them the pros and give them the cons. If they ask you what you would do, sure, offer it. If you have a great personal story to tell, a client that went through this before, tell the story. But as long as your heart is set as you're an agent for them, you cannot go wrong. But giving them, again, pro cons and guiding them to their decision. That's your job as an agent and not a salesperson. Don't be salesy. It doesn't work. You might make the sale now, but you're not going to get the referral business. You might talk them into something that they regret later and you know what they're going to say about you. Oh, so-and-so talked me into this house. He was awful. You know, this, I regret it to this day. It's it was awful. These are some of the words that kind of uh, bug me. Uh, are we, you know, please still, uh, we can go ahead and erase that off the screen if you don't mind. Uh, advisor is absolutely correct. Uh, so these are some of the words you hear in real estate a lot. Hey, you know, you gotta build your database. You gotta lead generate. You gotta network, you know, set up drip campaigns, do 33 touches. Again, all good things to do, okay? All good things to do, but I still want you not to forget that all of that is there to build long-term relationships. Okay? It's about the people, it's not the system, right? You don't buy a system to do all these things. Yeah, that's, that's great. But the goal of all these tools that you're trying to use is obviously to stay top of mind, make sure that your previous clients don't forget who you are, uh, but also that you are trying to build a long-term relationship with them. So be aware of what you're doing to do that. In, in the past, there have been all these tools that send basic garbage out to our clients. Don't forget to change your clock. Honestly, who cares, right? Our phones are smart enough now to do that. Hey, here's a pumpkin pie recipe, it's Thanksgiving. Your clients can ask Alexa these days. They don't need you to send that to them. That's very low value, right? Try to find ways to build long-term relationships and add value to that relationship from a real estate perspective, whether that's just from sheer personal care for them or a place of care or a real estate perspective where you're giving them items of value, articles of value, knowledge of value. That's what you should be doing to build that long-term relationship. Again, the software, the tools are only there to help enable you to do this. Don't forget that. Right? Don't lead with the tech and forget about the why. I think about four, about three or four family reunions ago, Adam Grant, the author, famous author of the book Give and Take and many other books, he came to speak at our Keller Williams National Convention, our family reunion. I can remember about five years ago, I remember sitting there 
and listening to his talk. And it was, it was just astounding. He wrote a book called Give and Take. There are three types of people in the world that he boiled down people to. One were the givers. Two were the matchers. Basically, I do for you, you do for me. And the third type were called the takers. Right? These are the people that just take from you. Right? They, they don't give very much and they just take. I found it really fascinating. Being in the corporate world for over 13 years in tech, I've seen a lot of takers. And you almost feel as you start climbing, I'm talking about senior management. I mean, the, the regular levels, there tend, tends generally to be a decent culture in most companies. But as soon as you get into management, you start seeing this, this behavior that's really odd. I mean, almost everyone is generally out for themselves. If they aren't, they have to protect themselves from people that are trying to take their territory or take their projects or, or take the raise, the raise pool, or the bonus pool. It becomes a strange battle that happens, almost survival of the fittest. He asked a question. He said, who do you think out of these three categories do well in the long run? And majority of the room raised their hand and said, oh, takers do. Takers take and they always succeed. It seems to us that they do. So he paused for a moment and he said, and he ran, and it was a survey he put on, on, on the chart. And he said, you're correct in the short run. In the short run, takers do better. Right, they took what territory they needed to, they did what they had to do, they got that short-term gain. He said, however, based on the studies that he did, the givers actually came out on top in the long run. And we thought that was really strange, but wow, how was that? And he said the reason for that was the givers, they basically were, were such giving and great people that people would do whatever, anything for these people in the long run. The takers eventually would get taken out, but the givers in the long run, people did more for them. And so they, they did better in the long run. I don't remember the metrics, let me go back and look again, but I found that to be a really nice message. And especially in our business, it's more important. And the reason I say that is, I know people that are matchers. It, 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 you know, oh, you, if you go out to dinner and you know, suddenly you know, you, you, you're, the giver will, I got this meal, don't worry about it. The taker, the, the matcher feels so guilty and, they have to treat you back afterwards, right? They have to, and then they, they can't forget it, and they're always trying to treat. The giver just gave because that's who they are, and they're generous people, right? The matcher looks kind of foolish, trying to match, and, oh, can, when can I take you out? And then persistently trying to, to do that, and it's just, it takes away from what the giver was trying to do. The, all you got to do is just give them back some of the time, and don't worry about it, right? The giver doesn't care, right? And that's what makes the giver so such a great personality for people they, people gravitate towards that person because they're so generous they're so generous and i really encourage you to try to walk this path if you can if this is who you are if this is not who you are don't try to pretend to be somebody that you're not and don't try to be. but if you can shift your personality and being this kind of person this is the way that you should try to do this and, and people paying it forward is really important people like people like that people gravitate towards people one lesson I learned and from one of our very own, Robert Stoltz, who's our team leader over here at Keller Williams, Santa Clara Valley, learned from him in tech. Bob does this perfectly and he does it. He's extremely genuine about it. And I remember I learned this from Bob at, in our Cisco days. Everyone he met and he ran into, he greeted every single person with kindness and respect. And mind you, Bob was a senior manager at the time where a lot of people were just engineers or we call them individual contributors, you know, brand new, new college hire, new hires, new college grads. It didn't matter who you were, Bob would greet you and care about you and ask you questions about how your weekend went, how was your family, and he'll remember and, and that, that relationship would continue to blossom over, over the years. Treated everybody with kindness and respect. Didn't matter who you were. There are so many people with egos, especially in our real estate business. You've met these people. Oh, gosh, I'm a... Omega, you know, don't talk to me. I'm Omega. You know, you know, don't waste my time with that question. Uh, not generally not at our our company. We have a great culture, but there are so many divas out there, egos, just constantly have to brown nose them, tell them how great they are. Luckily, at our office, we we at Keller Williams, we we we're very sharing, and giving people. I mean, I'm spending my time teaching class to you. I, I don't have any qualms about that because I want to make better agents. Don't be like that. Right, people smell people like that, and they don't like it. That those those folks do not inspire people. But give generously with no agenda. That that is the bottom line. If you're a giver, 
Show genuine care and concern. I brought that up as well. Go the extra mile. Even if you don't see an immediate return. It's sometimes frustrating when you meet with your CPA, right? You meet with your CPA, eventually you get a bill right away for a five minute question that you asked. And those kind of releases are really frustrating. Lawyers are the same, right? You ask them a five minute question, they bill you for half an hour. It does, that, that type of dynamic does not bode well for a long-term relationship. You know, you wouldn't believe how many type, times in my life I've met with people that say, you know what, I don't want to waste your time. We're not quite ready yet. So yeah, let's just, you know, let's just table. I said, you know, that's all right. Why don't let's grab coffee. Let's meet. I'm happy to give you whatever I can. And, and in those situations, they're typically not ready right away to buy a house. That's okay. Or sell a house. But why not be the expert that they want to meet with at that very moment in time when they kind of reach out, you know, they have a question, excuse me, a question, but you know, they, they're, they're feeling bad about bothering you. Why? Let's have this conversation. Real estate is what we do. If real estate is what we do, don't we want people to ask us questions when they have them instead of feeling bad about wasting our time? It's never a waste of time. And we're not lawyers. We're not CPAs. We don't bill by the hour. We, we, we can be generous with our time. I always sit down with them because even if they're not ready to do something now, we can create a plan for them so they can be ready six months, a year, two years from now. I've had people call me two years later. I've totally forgotten about the conversation. And they go, Alan, I'm finally ready. Thank you for keeping in touch with me. I'm finally ready to do this. I had this call three weeks ago with somebody I totally forgot. I thought they had found a little realtor. It turned out they were just running the house out and they weren't ready to sell at the time. And now we're discussing and trying to figure out the timing. I, but at the very least, if somebody is not ready to do something then, they will remember your generosity at that moment in time. And they will say nothing but great things about you. I liken this back to my days when I used to flip burgers at Dairy Bell. My, my, my owner at the time, owned, he owned Dairy Bell, and he had this idea, you know, we had bad management in here before, we're not in the ownership. Let's put out an ad in the local paper that gives a free ice cream cone with no purchase necessary just to build that goodwill. It was genius. We gave away a large cone. It was a dollar each cone. Most people that came in still bought something anyways, so you didn't really lose anything. We knew how to make it so that you could, you know, if you pulled a certain way, it looked bigger, but it was the same amount of ice cream. Right? If you knew how to use that soft serve machine properly, you could actually, it looks big, but same volume, right? So it's really no loss. You wouldn't believe it. People drove from downtown San Jose to Cupertino to get this cone. And they, there was nothing but goodwill. And when they saw our giant massive cone that was bigger than anyone else's cone, that, that was a large size, they, people would drive again and come back. So just again, those little things like giving, giving, giving really does pay back. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But in the long run, it usually does. At the very least, these people should be, might have someone else in mind that, want, that, want, that need real estate at that moment in time or later. They will remember you, but it's nothing but good. Nothing but good can come out of it. So don't be stingy about your time. Spend time with people. Your goal is to go and meet people and talk to them. I mean, that's really what your job is as a realtor. Go build those long-term relationships. Don't just think about tomorrow and my closings for next month. These are relationships that will, these seeds that you're planning and will come back. Always be positive as well. Being positive is really important. No one wants to be around a nervous Nelly or someone that's extremely negative all the time. Like who, who wants that? Right? Especially in this day and age where there's so much going on. There's so, every time you fire up the news, there's bad news about something, right? People don't want that. People want positive energy. People want to be around people like that. You got to find that within yourself to be that person. The law of reciprocity. Uh, people underestimate this. The law of reciprocity. When, when, when you spend that an hour with somebody, and by the way, I encourage you to buy that $3 coffee for that person as well. Don't underestimate that. People feel like they, oh, you don't want to get that person back for being so generous with their time and just get me a, a $3 cup of coffee. It's not even about the coffee, right? it's about the time. They feel like they want to reciprocate back in a positive way. But not that they owe you, but they just, if they can, they want to reciprocate. That's just the way it is. So be sure to be aware of that. Paying it forward, this is just, especially in the, in the States, this is part of our nature. We like to do that. So again, be a giver. You will net better results if you give rather than become a matcher or a taker, right? Takers are those sales folks at the car dealership. You just want to make that sale right now and then move on. Those are the takers. Right? Don't take whatever comes from them. 
You don't, I really don't want to be that. You want to be the giver because in the long run, you'll come out better. The other thing is be vulnerable. I want to put out a quote that I said in some other classes. Put yourself out there and good things will come. I want to say this again. Put yourself out there and good things will come. What do I mean by this? A lot of us are, are, are scared to go out or to reach out to people or to, in real estate we call it lead generation, right? There's a lead gen time. You're supposed to be reaching out to people. I hate to call that. It's just time you should be touching your clients and just pinging people and see how they're doing, right? That's all it really is. A lot of people are nervous about that. They're nervous about making the call. They're nervous about the text. They're nervous about the email. They're nervous about the Facebook direct message. They're nervous about the LinkedIn direct message or the Instagram direct message. I promise you this. If you don't reach out, if you do nothing, you're scared, you, whatever reason, if you, don't re, if you don't reach out, I can guarantee you, you will net zero business. Guarantee. If you do nothing, you will net zero. Promise you that. Maybe you're lucky. A few people call you and they're because they somehow don't remember you in the business. But in the long run, they will forget you. People don't remember their realtor after three to four years. What I mean by being vulnerable, and we do this in our Toastmaster, we have a Toastmasters in our office, is really putting your guard down that perfect life you have on Facebook. Everyone projects the most perfect life that they have on Facebook, right? And, and just taking that wall down and being honest, being truthful, being, we call it in, in Toastmasters, being real, being authentic. That, that really, really, really matters. And people see through that cloak, that, that, that wall that, that people have up. And being vulnerable or being authentic is extremely important to your customer base. They will gravitate you more if you are authentic. Obviously, be professional. I'm not saying, you know, let out your wildest side of, you know, binge drinking on the weekend. I mean, no, I don't want any of that. You still got to be professional, right? You got to have your professional persona. I'm not saying you go down to, you know, certain things you can talk about when you're having a beer with your friends. And watching a football game, that's different. But if you are being a true professional too at the same time, okay, but you can reveal parts of yourself to be vulnerable. I want to show you guys a video. You guys all know I'm a huge Star Trek fan. So I'm going to play a video for you. Uh, let me preface it a little bit. Uh, this is Isha Yar. There was a, a character in early Star Trek, uh, the next generation was called Tasha Yar. She actually died on a away mission. They found, they met the sister of hers on the planet. And this whole crew misses her a lot. So they trusted her right away. And so this is, on the right here is Data. He's an android. He has no feelings, no emotions. And he's trying to comprehend because she actually betrayed them in the end. They took, she took that trust and she betrayed them. And he's trying to make sense of this with uh, Commander Riker. So I'm going to fire this up here. Whoops, that would be Rocky. In all trust, there's the possibility of betrayal. I'm not sure you were prepared for that. Were you prepared, sir? I don't think anybody ever is. Then it is better not to trust. Without trust, there's no friendship, no closeness, none of the emotional bonds that make us who we are. And yet you put yourself at risk every single time. All right, I, I love Star Trek. I've lived my life learning so many lessons from Star Trek. But the point is, he's trying to comprehend as a machine, why? Why do humans do this? Right? Why do you put yourself out there to trust somebody? They could betray you. They could hurt you. And they're just saying, well, I guess I'm a machine. I guess I'm lucky. I don't, I, I'm not going to feel the pain of that. And then, so he's like, how fortunate. And Commander Riker goes, perhaps. But Riker knows if you don't put yourself out there, and you don't meet people. We've all have met friends that, have, that haven't been the greatest friends. We all have. But then we all have wonderful friends out there as well as part of our lives. It's part of life. You meet good folks, you won't meet bad folks. It's part of life. But if we never, if we kept holding on to that, that, the one bad one that betrayed me, and, then we would never have met the good ones right in there. And as humans, you kind of have to put yourself out there. If you don't, you're never going to 
you're never going to meet you know, any good folks. Same with real estate. If you don't put yourself out there, I guarantee you will net zero business. Guarantee. If you put yourself out there, good things will come. Don't be afraid of it. This is real estate. This is a people business. There's another broker that said this is a contact sport. Right? If you don't like people, you, 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 I remember there's somebody that, that was exiting, they were leaving of some sort, and they told me, I don't know if I really like driving buyers around. I don't really know if I really like people. I'm scratching my head going, you're in the wrong business. Because most realtors I know love people. They care about people. They give constantly to help people achieve their real estate dreams. That's what they do. I also want to, I want to talk about, well, when you meet somebody, how do you, how do you build that rapport? Remember we talked about the forming, storming, norming? This is very difficult. If you're hosting an open house, buyers that come in or sellers are immediately, they get immediately got a wall, right? You got a seller that goes, oh, I'm just a neighbor. Don't mind me. Tippy toe, tippy toe, they run out, right? Uh, you got the buyer, the buyer walks, oh, I got an agent already. Don't worry, don't talk to me, right? even though they don't. Right? Because the, if you put yourself in their shoes, they're afraid of being sold to. They don't want to be sold to. They don't want to give you their information. They don't want to, you to call them all day and harass them. And you know, their guard is up. Right, the guard is up and it's ex extremely hard to break down that barrier. I will give you some tricks. Again, remember, you all raised your right hand and so swore, solemnly swore that you would not go and create a Ponzi scheme with anything I'm teaching you. Right, this is all for good, none for evil. The key to getting to know somebody quickly is to build rapport. How do you do that? Building rapport means getting commonality. People like folks that are similar to them, right? I mean, it's very natural you, and it, it could go different ways, especially let's just talk about a quick situation. You're in a line at a grocery store or you're hosting an open house or things that are, are really quick interactions. You have to really get some clues, right? If they walk in with a, a, a certain logo of their school that you went to or your daughter goes to, your son goes to, your dad went to, I do this a lot. When I see someone walking with a cow bear hat or t-shirt, I go, go bears. Immediately they smile and then their guard goes down. If you don't watch sports, you probably should. At least know what the score was of your alma mater from this last Saturday. I was like, well, yeah, I, I don't really watch college sports. I'm more of a professional sports guy, but I will keep track of, of, of the scores of, of different, my, especially my alma maters. And if it comes up, I'll say, hey, you see the game on Saturday? Wow, we really beat we really beat Stafford by a lot of points. And then, oh yeah. And then their wall, their guard slowly comes down. If you can find a commonality and talk about something that's nothing related to sales, nothing related about home selling or home buying or anything business related, you're just trying to get commonality. Those of you with children, children are, are one of the, the, the best ways to get people to, to really see you as a parent, as a, fa a father or, or mother figure. I always have a picture of my kids in my phone, not because for this reason, but sometimes I will, when they ask me questions, do you have children? I'll just show my kids because I do love them death. And I just show them. And then immediately they go, oh, you know, they got that, that feeling like, wow, this person's great. He's a dad. He loves his kids. Kids are on his phone, which I absolutely do. Okay. But not all this is authentic. But and if they have children, even better. If they have children the same age, oh my gosh, you guys will be talking the same language. Right. So just, Again, children are all and also their children. If you see their children, maybe not in this day and age of coronavirus, but if you see their children in line, you know, make sure you just have the kid. Acknowledge the child that's there. Compliment something about the child, right? that, and also mention your children that all, as, as well. All of this goes to knocking that wall down. Again, mutual beliefs, culture. Sometimes, if you see somebody struggling in English, I'll sometimes just go right to Chinese at an open house or broker tour. I'll go right to the native language. And most of them are shocked that I can even speak the native language. And again, their guard goes down because they were struggling in English. So speaking Chinese is much better, right? Uh, sometimes talking about the news, do you ever wonder why people go, oh, what's the weather like today? Well, <laughs> that's the absolute last resort. If you can't think of anything else to talk about, you talk about weather. You wonder why a lot of salespeople talk about sports. They do that because depending on your audience, a lot of folks are into sports. And if you, that's a way to, when the, when the Warriors were going, everybody was talking about the Warriors, right? When the Giants were going, everyone was talking about the Giants. 
very exciting, something that, that people enjoy. You can talk about it, break down those walls. Same companies, if you worked at the same company that helps as well before, if you see somebody come in with a Google shirt or you used to work at Google or uh, one of these other companies, I just, well, yeah, what group you work in? Uh, yeah, I used to work in, uh, and immediately they go, oh, wow, you used to work at the same company I do. Well, that's different, right? Especially the realtors on this call who used to be in tech, that's a huge plus. Because a lot of people think realtors just, you know, don't never worked in tech and don't understand them. That's not true. Right? A lot of us have worked in tech or work in corporate. You know, try to build those commonalities. Really good way to break down those walls early. Another way, which I was reminded by today on a different call, if you look up somebody on social media, uh, specifically, I would, I'm saying, let's say LinkedIn, you want to be careful how you do this. If you, LinkedIn is designed for people to know people are okay with you looking them up on LinkedIn. Okay. So you look them up on LinkedIn you go and you see mutual connections. If you're smart, you can do your homework before this meeting. Let's say you're meeting a new buyer, a new seller. And, and you notice somebody in there, you can even pick Hey, how do you know Bob? How do you know Bob? Just out of curiosity. Oh, I don't really know Bob that well. Okay. That's fine. It's a person too. How do you know Bob? Oh gosh. Bob and I went to, went to, went to high school together. We go way back. Oh, wow. Great. You can handle this a couple of ways. You can either ask your good friend number two to put in a good word for Bob. Say, hey, I heard you were meeting with, with Alan tomorrow. I just want to know he's a great guy. You could do that way. The second way would be when you meet up with them, you know, then a conversation goes, oh, by the way, I was, I was just connecting with you on LinkedIn. And I noticed you also know, you also know, you know, Bob. How do you know Bob? And sometimes you can even open with that if you want. Now, Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I've done this where they, oh yeah, I went to high school with that person and I've done it where they go, well, you know, I don't even know why that person's in my network. So try to figure it out. I mean, as much time as you have to do the research, but that commonality oftentimes will provide a way for, it's just social proof that you are a good person. And that's very, very important in, in life because people have their guard up, right? They, they meet a new agent if they called you off a postcard or off some online flyer or, or ad that you put out they're, they're guards up they don't know you right if they're referred in it's a lot easier if you're referred in then those walls are generally down but if you meet them first time there's always that so try to leverage those relationships it'll help create a much better meeting and it's even more powerful when the people that you're connected to they used to be your clients and they can advocate for you because i guarantee you they will ping their friends later say hey alan's he good and that person says, oh gosh, he's my realtor, he's awesome. Then you've got that client, okay? Be careful about using any other social media. Facebook, for example, if you say, oh, hey, I looked you up on Facebook, time out. That is a little shady for a lot of people. I don't think realtors understand the separation between business, social networking, LinkedIn, and Facebook because our lives kind of mesh together. And that's why we get confused because you know, our business are our clients. So that's why we have them on Facebook. Other folks out in the world do not do it this way. They have their business contacts on LinkedIn and they have their friends on Facebook. So if you say, oh, hey, I looked you up on Facebook and I noticed you went to a play yesterday, they will throw up a wall because that is scary. Oh, wow, you're stalking me, aren't you? That is scary to a lot of people. Don't do that. Be careful how you use this. That's not how people want to be viewed. Instagram, I guess, that might be a little lighter since most of it's public, I guess. Uh, Instagram is, I guess, just photo sharing. That might be all right. Uh, but your safest bet would be LinkedIn and Twitter. Those would be the two avenues that people are, 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 are sharing. Right? But if you're, people, are not, people are a little sensitive about Facebook, be careful. They're, they're supposed to be their personal networks. So I want to warn you. Jeff Weiner, former CEO of LinkedIn, uh, I guess he's shifting over to chairman now, said this, trust equals, well, he heard from a friend, but he's been quoted saying, trust equals consistency over time. One thing I mentioned was social media. A lot of you are very uh, involved in social media, which is great. But I wanna challenge you, if you look at your social media, trust is not just that one coffee meeting you have with somebody. If they look you up on Facebook, and they, I guarantee you they will. They'll look up your Facebook, your Instagram, your LinkedIn. What are they going to see? Are they going to see a consummate professional who is always professional, working, taking classes, teaching classes, hosting open houses, really an expert in their field? Or what are they going to see? Somebody who parties a lot? 
out drinking all the time, uh, you know, going to Vegas all the time. Hey, what are they going to see, right? You need to be very careful with your social media. I want to challenge everybody on this call right now because trust equals consistency over time. If they log on and see one great moment of yours, that's great, but they're going to click and they're going to go dig and see what kind of person is this person. And they're going to judge you at that moment and you have either won or lost the client. I want you to be very careful, right? If you, if you know your personal, personalize your personal life, make sure you turn off those settings, make it very private, only the right people, your immediate friends on your network, but whatever else is out there is going to be out there. So think about what perception, what brand you want to build when you're, when you're on social media. Very, very important. Business casual always on Facebook is what I say. Be very careful with what you post. Another movie I really like, Despicable Me, some of you with kids. Uh, this is a scene where Gru is set up on a blind date by a mutual friend, and her name is Shannon on the right. If you guys watch Despicable Me, Gru is not, he does not have hair. He's actually bald. But he's showing up, he's trying to impress her, and Shannon is kind of suspecting it right now. Ooh, is it hot in here? Ooh, how's the food? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you wearing a wig? What? Oh, I don't think so. I knew it. You're a phony. I hate phony. Oh, what? No, these locks are all mine. No, they're not. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to rip that thing off your head and show everyone what a ball I don't think so, Miss Lady. My point this is, nobody likes a phony. You obviously have to be authentic and be who you are, but be professional is my key. But don't pretend to be somebody that you aren't because people will eventually sniff it out and they will know. You don't want to be a phony. Don't, don't ever be a phony. Be authentic. But make sure that your authentic self can get you more business, that it actually is conducive to that. We're all allowed private lives. I'm not saying you're not allowed. I think sometimes in this day and age, we put too much of it out there without being purposeful about what we're doing. So be careful with that is what I'm telling you. Okay? And don't be a phony. Be authentic. Okay, I want to I wanna take all, for all of us to take a step back. I want everybody, everybody close your eyes. Close your eyes. Yeah, your eyes closed. I can't really check. I'll have to have Olivia check and see if you, you all close your eyes. But close your eyes. Okay. I want you to go back to your first love. Now, rewind, rewind past the breakup, unless you marry your high school sweetheart. No, rewind behind that. I know. You guys are smiling. Rewind. Now, go back to the first time you met that person. Remember that moment, right? That first time, that first love, that, that sweet moment in time when you first met somebody and you... You fell in love and, and all the beautiful things that come with that, that feeling, right, that you have, that first love. You never forget your first love, they say, right? All right, open your eyes. The reason I want to say this is most of us have first-time home buyers or first-time home sellers. It's their first time. Yes, I know most of us sell quite a bit of homes, at least more than one, I hope. And after a while, it feels like Groundhog Day. Sometimes it does, isn't it? You... You have the consultation, you're driving the at homes, you're running a CMA, you're getting disclosures, and then you're, you're writing an offer, you're competing, sometimes you're losing if the market's hot, and, and then rinse, repeat, right? Inspect it, close, sign off, close, and repeat. And for those of us who've been doing this 17 years, I can tell you, it does feel like Groundhog Day. Right? Hundreds of homes later, sometimes it does feel like Groundhog Day. But at least for me personally, I don't feel that way. I still... I always try to ground myself with the first time when I meet buyers. I love that they're trying to get started. I love that they, they don't know what they're doing because I'm here to help guide them. And I love being a part of that. I absolutely do. For those of you that don't love doing this, really look at yourself and see if you really want to do this for 17 years with me. Because if you don't love it, you're going to burn out. You're going to hate it. So just, just remember that. But I love it. I love seeing it. And I love being a part of it. And I hope you do too. I really, really hope you do too. But take yourself to the first, back to the first time that you bought a house. Remember how lost you were? 
Remember all these weird acronyms you didn't know what they were? Remember how much you leaned on your agent because you just had no clue what was going on? And that first time you got the key, how happy you were? Cherish that moment. Remember that and somehow bottle it up and use it to fuel your day every single day. Use it. Same with selling a home. It's stressful. Most people don't sell a home every seven, I think it's 10 years now. It's a very strange, strange concept to most people. So you have to be careful and just be sensitive to that. And don't, don't be that agent that, that just forgot about that. Goes, oh my gosh, you know, just listen to me. I've been doing this a long time. Don't be that agent. Be sensitive. Understand that people, they, they, you know, this is very emotional for them. Right? If, if this was so easy, they would just automate us today. Why would they need us? Why do you think they pay us a big bucks? We can make good, good, good income here in the Bay Area because of just the way that the, the home prices are. Earn your check. Help your clients. Be there for them in the tough time. Remember the first time. Remember that first time you fell in love. That's what we were going to get. You probably noticed I've, I've played this, this a lot. I love Jerry Maguire. I had my kids watch it last week. Obviously, some censored scenes, but and they loved it as well. And something I will, I will, I will tell you. So this is, on the left here is Rod Tidwell. Rod Tidwell is a 5'8 wide receiver for the Arizona Cardinals. He's apparently very good. He's breaking a lot of records, a lot of top receivers. He's breaking the records. But Rod Tidwell has an attitude. Rod Tidwell is always, always complaining why he's not getting paid and why this and why that. And the coaches like his talent, but they hate this ego that he has. This, they call it a chip on the shoulder. They hate it. That's why they won't pay him. They don't want a toxic person in their locker room. They don't want it. And this is Jerry Maguire talking to him about it. I'll tell you why you don't have your $10 million yet. Right now, you are a paycheck player. You play with your head, not your heart. Your personal life, heart. But when you get on the field, it's all about what you didn't get, who's to blame, who underthrew the pass, who's got the contract you don't, who's not giving you your love. You know what? That is not what inspires people. That is not what inspires people. Shut up. Play the game. Play it from your heart. And you know what? I will show you the quality. That's the truth, man. That's the truth. Can you handle it? It's just a question between friends. You know? Oh, and when they call you shrimp, I'm the one who defends you. I want to be friends with you. Fine. And quit using that word, quad. That's my word. I'll see you in LA. No heart. No heart? I'm all heart. <clears throat> all right. I'm going to filter that right there. You get, the, you get the gist here, what I'm saying here. Real estate is a tough business. It's a long business. It's a daily grind, nightly grind. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. You're, you don't have one's life. I'm sorry. I know I've met some realtors that try to balance and turn off their phones at 6 o'clock when their clients get off work and they, they finally have time to look at your, your documents and come up with a plan on their house and you're not available. I just don't think that's that's really what customers need. It's 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 a dedication. It's a love for your client. It takes hard. It takes hard to be in this business. And I hope that each one of you on this call love this business as much as I do. Love your clients as much as I do, and play with your heart. Because if the, your clients know that you're just out there for the paycheck, they will smell it. They will smell you pushing them to buy a house that they shouldn't be buying. They will hear you say, "Oh, that inspection line is not a big deal." When it is a big deal because you want your paycheck, because you're a paycheck player. You don't want to be a paycheck player. You want to be there for your client. And Jerry Maguire is having a very authentic moment because he's been biting his tongue for a very long time with Rod Tidwell about his attitude and all that. And literally after this moment in time, I want to spoil the movie for you, but you know all Hollywood endings. Rod Tidwell starts playing with heart. And with all Hollywood endings, things go well. I would encourage you guys to find that in you because people can tell when you're a fake or not. All right, so I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna power through this. It's funny, real estate has changed a lot in the last few years. I know in the past, we, there's been a lot of talk about, oh, let's buy these online leads from this portal, that portal, and then create a inside sales group to call these people, filter down the list, or hire buyers agents to just call these leads, and then you know, out of 100, you get maybe one conversion. That's the way we should do business. What's fascinating to me is, is slowly, Agents are starting to come around that 
that model of fear of removal is for investment. And also it's very hard and it's very miserable to be cold calling a list of leads that don't care about you at all, who you're trying constantly fighting this uphill battle with. What I found fascinating is that for even Keller Williams, as we're building our new, our new tech platform in the last four years, has boiled it back down again to the fundamentals, to what they call, what is your sphere of influence? Who are your friends, your family, your previous clients, your second degree friends and family? Your, your, I mentioned customers. What are your groups of people that you're affiliated with? People that know, love, and trust you already. Those are the people that will give you business in a heartbeat if they knew that you wanted business, number one. If you didn't ask, and that's something you need to do. You didn't stay top of mind. That's one problem. Two, you didn't even ask them, hey, do you have, if you know anybody that, that needs that needs, I'm here. And three, just being that subject matter expert in your sphere of influence. As many years as I've been doing this, is as big as my team getting, it's still from our sphere of influence. It's people that have no loved and trust us for years, repeat clients, constantly referring like a great restaurant, telling their friends and family and their colleagues about us. And it's just been spiraling from there. Once you get that foundation set, there's no stopping you. Is there a little bit of a lead time? Yes. Do you think I started 17 years ago with any of this? Absolutely not. I started out with my friend's family, a small group of 250 friends on Friendster. And then I would build my network, my database. I would build it with people that I, 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 customers I got from open houses. I did exactly what all of you are doing as newer agents, door knocking, open houses, do what you got to do to get started. But once you get that base, you start building and building and building on top of it. And eventually you only have to call a person again. They will find you because you're so good at keeping top of mind. You have such a good reputation, a good social media presence. You are the subject matter expert. They would not think of going anywhere else. And there's enough business for all of us in this way where we don't have to pay these, these portals ridiculous amounts of money to buy zip codes where they con you out of it anyways. A week later, they sell to another agent to be the number one. And then you're calling these people who don't care about you at all. They just hang up on you. They don't want to talk to you. They don't know who you are. They go on Facebook and go, does anyone have a good realtor? Because I don't trust any of these other people I'm meeting online. That's what they do. And your name better come up. Your name better come up when they ask that question to their friends. Just talked about fundamentals. If you can exceed the expectations of your clients today and earn their business, you earn their business and the business of their friends and family for a lifetime. I'm telling you, this is how you do it. Have a long-term view on your, on your, on your business. All right. 202, a couple minutes over.